love Venice. Venezia, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. A city that both delights the eye and uplifts the soul wherever you cast your gaze. Discovering Venice at dawn is like being reborn into a world of art and grace. What can compare with the intimate yet grandiose sight of a stream of golden light stretching over the bay and covering the marble statues on the palaces with an ochre veil? In just a few more minutes, the winged lions of the Piazza San Marco will cast off their night robes. Venice, which has been forecast an unavoidable death for centuries, is sadly in the throes of agony, and its quaint charms could soon be part of the past under the combined effects of the tides and the weather. The beautiful isle would then, too, become the stuff of legend, alongside other lost cities, such as Sodom and Gomorrah, East and Atlantis. That time is not yet upon us, but the Laguna is already a living allegory to the pride of man confronted with the transient nature of things. And yet, on this string of unstable and moving islands, a city-state, like those in Pisa and Genoa, rose up and still stands today as the defiant vestige of that magnificent century in which everything seemed possible. The Quattrocento. As a result of its strategic position at the gates to the east, the heart of the city, formed on the ashes of the Roman Empire in 421, rapidly acquired incredible business and military power. By lending its boats to the Crusaders in 1204, Venice the Conqueror took control of Byzantium. The sack of Constantinople enabled it to extend its power over the whole of the eastern Mediterranean. This view of the Rialto Bridge, spanning the Grand Canal, could be a snapshot straight out of the 16th century Venice, when it was at the height of its glory. Being fine navigators and enlightened strategists, the Venetians now needed to build themselves a city in their image, with a Grand Council dominated by a corporation of merchants, with houses that could double up as warehouses, and with waterways that would serve as roads to transport merchandise. The old swampland became a forest of palazzi, ranging from the Byzantine style for the oldest of them to the Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque for the more recent ones, such as the Ca Pesaro, which still houses an outstanding collection of objets d'art from Asia. The Grand Canal is four kilometers long. It's the main artery of Venice. Other narrower canals, called rios, cross the Sestieri, the six districts that have made up Venice since 1171. The Canareggio Canal that crosses a more populated Venice leads out on the other side of the city to the Laguna. In Venice, space is a luxury that St. Mark's Square has treated itself to. It's the only square allowed to use the name Piazza, all the others having to make do with being just campo. 
Located near the Laguna, it is also the first square to suffer the onslaughts of the high tide, Aqua Alta. A symbol of the power and sovereignty of the Serenissima, St. Mark's Square makes an ideal viewing ground from which to admire the breathtaking Campanile Bell Tower, the magnificent San Marco Basilica, and the majestic Dodge's Palace. Balanced atop a lacework of columns, the Dodge's Palace is an architectural rarity. It was rebuilt between the 14th and 15th centuries, having been destroyed in a fire. It was the political, legal, and religious center of the Venetian Republic. Earthly power and celestial strength were closely linked in Christian Venice, which is why it is no great surprise to see Eve being tempted by the apple on the corner of this palace. The San Marco Basilica was the Doge's private chapel before it became the Cathedral of Venice. In a style reminiscent of Byzantium and the Orient, it was rebuilt in the 11th century to house the relics of Saint Mark, the heavenly protector chosen to rival Saint Peter, who was the powerful patron saint of Rome. In the first century, Mark, who had set out to evangelize the region, was shipwrecked off the coast of what was later to become Venice, and an angel appeared before him. After his death, two Venetian merchants brought back the evangelist's mummified body from Alexandria, and it was believed to hold divine powers. Even today, those divine mysteries are still exerting their powers of attraction on the crowd of onlookers outside, as well as on those who've been sucked inside. Here the shadows of the darkened walls compete with the gold of the mosaics, which spread over 4,000 square meters and cover the domes, walls, and floor. Dominating St. Mark's Square, the clock tower plunges us back into reality. At its summit, two bronze giants coated with the sheen of time seem to be summoning the troops. Piazza San Marco is the favorite meeting place of Venetians and pigeons. It's impossible to imagine the square without the relentless rustling of these bothersome birds that seed sellers encourage people to feed, to the visitors' great delight. The damage inflicted by their droppings on the fragile stone of the Venetian buildings is cause for concern, especially given that the arcades that border the square are home to hundreds of nesting places. To control the proliferation of pigeons, it was decided that St. Mark's Square should be the only area of Venice where feeding them is permitted. For it is also this joyous spectacle to the strains of the orchestras in the background that has made the square's elegant cafes so famous. The Café Florian is one such must-see institution. A survivor of fashions, it offers a luxurious insight into the artistic profusion and commercial wealth Venice has known. The cafe was uh, born in 1720 by uh, a gentleman uh, with the name of Francesco Florian. Uh, very soon it became clear to everybody that the cafe was going to be a cafe with artistic tendency. The Biennale was born in this place. Uh, Canova was a, a very good friend of the owner of the cafe and he, Canova himself, helped uh, give an artistic tendency to the cafe because he was attracted all uh, 
the artistic uh, people, uh, journalists, uh, politicians uh, in this cafe. There were literature, there were philosophy, and it, it, it stayed that way throughout these years. So even today we do the same thing. We still have a politician that comes here, we have uh, artists uh, from all kind. To go back on the history, the legend is saying that Casanova, when he ran away from the jail, uh, stopped here, had a cup of coffee, and then continued his run uh, um, throughout Europe or throughout Italy. We are now have about 65 people that work here. We serve about one million uh, customers a year. Most of our work is done during the season, the hot season, so from March to October. With the exception of uh, Carnival, uh, which is in February, which is a huge, a huge event for us, because we have customers that come back for, for years. Uh, people come here uh, with four or five different costumes and change the same days. After a visit to the Piazza San Marco, you might have the impression you've seen all there is to see in Venice. You would be very wrong. The sight of the Santa Maria della Salute at the mouth of the Grand Canal will convince you there's a great deal left to see. Dedicated to the Virgin, this Baroque masterpiece is commensurate with the Venetians' act of faith, who, following the terrible plague of 1630, wanted to erect the biggest and most beautiful shrine to Our Lady, who returned them to safety and health. Unfortunately, the architect Baldassare Longhena did not live long enough to see the paintings of Titian and Tintoretto, or the marble statues of Just Le Cour that take up residence in the six chapels fanning out from the vast central space. But perhaps a faint echo of the prayers to the Virgin reaches the ears of the artist who created such a magnificent shrine a shrine that encapsulates some of the fervent praises, expressing purity, solemnity, and magnificence. Far from shortchanging the visitor with its charms, Venice's beauty is resplendent everywhere, from its religious buildings to its lay architecture. Away from the Grand Canal, in the lesser known area of the Rio Morin, is the Palazzo Gradenigo. The 16th century jewel hides many a fine treasure within its two wings that join at right angles. Both a home and a workplace it was first and foremost an object of splendor for its rich owners, but it was also the accurate and cruel reflection of their changing fortunes. In the expert hands of its latest occupant, the palace is slowly recovering from the wounds inflicted on it over the centuries. My name is Toto Bergamo Rossi. I'm in charge of restoring the historical heritage of Venice. Not just the city itself, but everything it represented over the centuries. We work a lot in Croatia as the old Republic of Venice stretched as far as Greece. We try to maintain all traces of Venice, even beyond the city, in countries where they need us more. The Gradenigo family, one of the founding families of Venice in the 8th century, built this palace in various phases. The palace was constructed in the Gothic period, rebuilt in the Renaissance period, 
And what we see today is the result of the restoration carried out by Baldassare Longhena, who built the Santa Maria della Salute Church and extended the palace. They planted this enormous garden, which was one of the biggest in Venice at the time. The house remained a single residence until the beginning of the 20th century, when the family ran into financial difficulty. Part of the family sold their share in the 50s. But even worse, the high second floor ceiling was lowered, leaving just the first floor of this lovely home. The palace came into my hands five years ago. It was in a terrible state. Luckily, I work in conservation and could do something with it. Even this room was divided into three, with little walls and partitions. It's actually three palaces together. They are not true classic symmetrical Venetian palaces with one large room in the middle and all the other rooms off to the side. It's a different sort of model. It doubled in size during the Baroque period to include the wing over there under the façade. You rarely see that in Venice, and they added a service wing behind, where there were stables for the horses. This palace is classified, so we get tax advantages and a government subsidy for any work done on the property that is approved by the local authorities and the Ministry of Culture. My job is twofold. It's not just about restoring public or church heritage. It's also my home. <laughs> The Palazzo Gradenico is today one of the rare Venetian palaces not to have been transformed into a hotel or museum. Its testimony is priceless. A change of scene and district as we head for Castello, the eastern part of Venice, where huge walls enclose a shipyard quite unique in Europe, the Arsenal. This guarantor of Venice's maritime supremacy for over seven centuries has been shut down and can only be visited on rare occasions. We can still admire its fine water entrance with its two elegant fortified towers. Close by, its land entrance takes the form of an old triumphal arch. In the 16th century, 16,000 laborers worked in the foundries spread out over 25 hectares of shipyard and outer harbors where they manufactured oars, masts, and boats. A few meters away, a curiosity can be seen that is found on many buildings in Venice, a lion's mouth for depositing denunciation letters. to a different, more recent Venice, the Venice of the Dolce Vita. Welcome to the Cipriani Hotel. The Cipriani opened its doors in 1963 and constitutes a luxurious oasis on the eastern tip of the island of Giudecca, opposite St. Mark's Square. It is one of the world's most prestigious hotels. Cipriani was uh, created by a poet more than a, rest a hotelier. He was a poet restaurateur, Mr. Giuseppe Cipriani, who created the Harris Bar in 1936, where he started serving meals very simply with Italian uh, flavors. Another beautiful uh, sort of addition to the hotel, which only had uh, uh, 103 rooms when we took it over, 
uh, was the acquirement of the Palazzo Vendramin and the Palazzetto, by which we added 15 suites and junior suites, serviced because of the distance from the hotel, which is reachable through the gardens, about 200 meters, uh, serviced by butlers who are doing everything. They act as butlers, but they act also as, as concierges, as receptionists, because they receive the clients in, in the hotel when they arrive here. They take them over. And uh, it's kind of a different kind of service, which is very much appreciated by the clients. Every year we're investing substantially to, to modify and to to make the hotel better. Uh, last year, for instance, we did uh, 22 new balconies because the hotel didn't have so many balconies. Now we have pr practically 70% of our rooms have got either terraces, uh, patios around the pool or balconies. And this was a very important thing to do because it gives quite a lot to the, the clients who are wanting, they're here in Italy and they want to have uh, to see, to enjoy also the outside instead of the inside. Nearby, there were all the wineries, abandoned wineries, which were called Casanova wineries. So we decided to replant them partially, keeping the good ones. And we now produce about 2,000 bottles a year of wine, which we winify, we do the wine in Tuscany. In the, in the domain of Mr. Sherwood, which is called Capannelle. We're very fortunate to have this base of clients that come sometimes two or three times a year. And uh, we also have events uh, like uh, the Biennale, the Art Biennale, uh, that uh, takes place usually in June, the opening of it, and then it lasts on a period of six months and then the film festival at the end of August, beginning of September. These are traditional events that draw a lot of people in the hotel. It's time to learn about an original creation by Giuseppe Cipriani, a cocktail invented in 1948 at the famous Harry's Bar. To do a good bellini, you need the white peaches. In a bowl, you put some lemon, water, and you peel the peaches. You cut them in small pieces. Put in a blender. The pieces of peaches, we need to help the juice with some raspberry, just for the color. Some ice pile, we blend the juice with the peaches. Now, one third of juice and two thirds of sparkling wine, Prosecco. That's the Bellini. We're on board a motoscafo, a Venetian taxi, to transport ourselves towards the northern islands on a journey into time, taking us back to the barbarian invasions of the 5th and 6th centuries a period in which farmers and fishermen along the coast, forced to take refuge at the mouth of the Po, became the first inhabitants of the Laguna. On the island of Torcello, the Santa Fosca Church and the Santa Maria Assunta Cathedral are the only vestiges of its former prosperity. In its glorious era around 1500, this small island, which is almost totally deserted today, boasted up to 20 churches where some 20,000 inhabitants jostled to attend services. Greek master masons built Santa Fosca onto an older church in the 11th century. It was decorated with slim columns and was once covered in frescoes of which a few rare remains survive today. As the centuries drew on, the rising power of Venice 
The silting up of the canals and the ravages caused by malaria announced the death of Torcello, which was abandoned and then forgotten. Only the most nostalgic of walkers now come to plunge back into the romantic atmosphere of the sleepy island. The Locanda Cipriani has been serving them lunch since 1935. I'm the nephew of Mr. Giuseppe Cipriani, who actually was the, the founder of the Locanda Cipriani. And I was born in Rome, but I've been working in the Locanda now for 26 years. Giuseppe uh, founded the Locanda in, uh, in 1934. Uh, he actually came uh, by boat, by rowing boat, to, to Torcello. He saw this place. It was an ancient uh, um, cellar, wine cellar. And he got in love with this place, and he decided to buy the house. So that was in the 34. And then he opened the Locanda. At the beginning, it was only a restaurant in, the, in 1936. Uh, after a few years, after the war, he decided to open as well some rooms. And then the history of the Locanda started. I mean, in, in, we have had a lot of people, actually. I mean, there are thousands of people coming every year. At the beginning, there were most the kind of intelligentsia who used to come to Torcello because you had to imagine at that time there were no public transport, so there were no other solution to come to Torcello apart from uh, taking a water taxi. It was very, very expensive at that time, so just few people could afford to get to the island with, by water taxi. So at the beginning, there were a lot of people, famous people, I mean, a lot of uh, writers, um, kings and queens, and uh, uh, people used to come to Venice during the time, and they, they knew my grandfather in the house bar, and they did decide to come to Torcello. Since then, uh, all these people have become to come to Torcello, and they're still coming now to Torcello. One of the, major, the most famous uh, guests we had was Ernest Hemingway. Uh, he used to come here for the first time in 1948. And uh, for, in this year, my grandfather kept the Locanda open all through the winter because Hemingway was a great uh, lover of uh, hunting, going hunting in the lagoon. So this one of the most famous persons at that time. Since then, with a lot of people, I mean, the, the Queen, all the royal family, the English royal family, I mean, the Queen Mother, the Queen Elizabeth, the Prince Charles, Lady Diana, they used to come here. Uh, writer like uh, Miller, like uh, other famous people, actor and actresses of uh, Hollywood, I mean, Charlie Chaplin, all the major singer like uh, La Callas, all these kind of people, I mean, used to come to Torcello. And since nowadays, I mean, they're still coming. There are no more that people, but other other famous VIP now we have. It's a very nice place, actually. You have to imagine. Seems to be in the in the countryside, but we, you are in the lagoon. So that's uh, the atmosphere you have here is really unique in Venice. After our rustic stopover, another of the Laguna Islands still holds a surprise for us. Since 1291, Murano has harbored a unique craft within the secret of its walls, that of the Glassmasters. Moi, je suis Carlo Moretti. Nous avons commencé cette histoire. My name is Carlo Moretti. The Carlo Moretti story began in 1958 with my brother. Avec mon frère, on a commencé. We started from nothing and became highly qualified in the world of design. We employ some 40 artisans and create objects that are a bit untraditional even if we handcraft them in typical fashion. We have always made an effort to create original pieces. Every week, we come up with something new, either a series of objects or glasses, and produce something a little different from what is generally done in Murano. I 
toutes les pièces qui sont produites ici. I design all the pieces that are produced here, with a few exceptions. Peut-être vous ne voyez même ici parce que travailler avec des artistes. Working with glass artists is very difficult. To design something, you must have knowledge of the substance you work with, and you must also know the workers and the masters who can produce it. We started out making objects that were more or less in keeping with the Murano tradition. But almost immediately, we broke away from tradition to make different pieces, designing them using very little and simplifying them. The Murano style is thoroughly contemporary and easily recognizable, but the technique used is age-old. Countess Marie Brandolini, of French origin, has invited us to her workshop. It began precisely in 1291 in Murano, when a decree was issued forbidding the presence of furnaces in Venice for safety reasons. So all the existing furnaces were grouped together on the island of Murano. In this way, if they caught fire, it would remain within a contained area. When I first arrived, I simply wanted to copy the glass pieces I had seen. It didn't work out, so I took charge of things and began creating individual pieces with what we call marini, which are sticks of glass with a design through the center that slice like bread. Using this substance, I make glass objects one by one, which are all uniquely different. I'll make a glass object so you can see how it's done. I cut the little sticks into small pieces like this. Like in a recipe, I regularly improvise. André is picking out the marini I've chosen and whose design I've already explained to him to make a glass composition. I used to do that job when I worked with the glass masters. And now he rolls the glass mass. The glass has been worked in the same way for 4,000 years. Nothing has changed except the fuel in the furnaces. It's no longer fed by wood gathered on the mainland, but by gas. But the movements and even the tools are exactly the same. I think it's one of the only industries where you find the techniques unchanged since the beginning. Murano glass is very flexible, which distinguishes it from Bohemia glass or glass from Poland or elsewhere. The glass piece is almost finished, and then it goes into the oven where it will be tempered. At the end of the day, we turn off the oven, close the doors, and the temperature will slowly drop overnight until it reaches room temperature the following morning, so you won't see the result until the following morning. It's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Good luck, my baby, it's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. And we move you, chips, chips. The last stopover on our tour of the Laguna Islands is Burano, which is the most colorful and lively of all the islands. The locals live to the rhythm of fishing trips.
Bien, bien. No perder ti per niente al mundo. Lo spettacolo d'arte varia. Yo uno innamorato di te. Eh? It's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Get like my baby, it's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Murano has its glass workers, and Burano has its lace makers. Every Laguna Island harbors its own secrets. Concentrated today in the lace making school, they carry on the tradition. In days gone by, women would sit on the front steps of each house, working their fingers over complex patterns for hours on end. This aerial dance called Punto in Aria, Stitches in the Air, produces the finest of lace that can even be mistaken for tulle. A marvel based on the legend of a faithful sailor who resisted the mermaid's charms and was rewarded with a superb veil of foam that he gave to his fiancée as a gift. A magic veil that the ladies of Burano have been reproducing since the 16th century, thus creating the glory and fortune of their island. The King of France, Louis XIV, wore the precious lace on his collars, and all the courts of Europe followed suit. A clock tower competing with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and an interlacing of small, richly painted houses, which the fishermen can make out by their colors. These are the images of Burano we'll remember as we return to the more populated areas of Venice, San Polo, Santa Croce, and Canareggio. stretching from the Rialto to the Madonna dell'Orto, narrow streets and unadorned facades reveal another facet of Venice, a quieter and more intimate side. This is where the majority of Venetians live, although at siesta time, it's hard to believe. Here is a Venice stripped of its artifices. The Venice of its origins, bridges without parapets, and streets full of dark shadows, even in the heart of summer. This is the Venice where a dove was said to have guided the first settlers in the 9th century on their quest for a land free from war and disease. Gradually, life fell into place. Squares started to appear around wells. Rundown gullies became streets, and names were put onto maps. The first markets sprung up with the expansion of trade in the Mediterranean. The Campo dei Mori thus owes its name to the three brothers who allegedly came from the Peloponnese in Greece to trade their fabric. A house in the square bears witness to one of them as part of its facade. Try to picture this part of Venice with its eastern promise and intoxicating perfumes, as we're also in a former pleasure district where prostitutes flaunted their charms. Now that the Madonna dell'Orto has stopped singing, we can enter the veritable den of iniquity that is Cantina do Mori without feeling guilty. This is one of the city's oldest osterias. Here, dolci and francobolli are served beneath the rows of copper saucepans. Food lovers, beware. Giving in to temptation is a cardinal sin. <laughs> Il 
la in the 14th century, Venice's maritime supremacy increased the population of a wave of immigrants who were not always given the warmest welcome. The Ghetto Novo was the area chosen to confine the Jewish community in overpopulated eight or nine story houses. These quickly became run down, so much so that the word ghetto, that originally referred to the district's metalworks, rapidly became extended to mean all communities where people had to live on top of each other. Today, this part of the city within the city is cheerful and typical. Some 200 families still live here. But at the entrance to the ghetto, commemorative plaques recall the painful past of the Second World War. And the very cultural and religious differences that nearly caused the extinction of this people now perpetuates them. Venice would not be Venice without the beautiful ballet of its gondoliers. These strange characters have been gliding across the city's canals since the 11th century. Although there were 10,000 gondoliers at the end of the 19th century, only 400 are left today. They are made by just a handful of craftsmen. These majestic boats, once painted in bright colors until a Senate decree forced them to be black so they would be more discreet, have lost nothing of their superb appearance. At its height, Venice was a powerful republic, stretching from the Mediterranean to the north of the Alps, amassing its wealth through trade. Salt was stocked in large warehouses along the canals, and exotic spices and oriental fabrics were sold along the banks. The town's population probably never exceeded 160,000. But beyond the seas, the Venetians created outposts in Crete and Cyprus, thereby protecting the strategic pathways to the east. On land, Venice's penchant for expansion involved sending envoys throughout Europe. In the 15th century, Venice was at the height of its power. It was as powerful as the kingdoms of France and England. More than 6,000 merchant ships sailed the seas. Not so long ago, in the grand scale of time, a dashing young lover joined in the dance with his courtesans, the motoscafo, the Venetian water taxi. This distinguished lover transports the wealthier visitors on the waterways. The air hangs heavy with eternal promises not all of which are intended solely for this Serenissima. Preferisco così Senza troppo rumore On a day like this, you wonder where the former queen of the Adriatic is hiding in the Venice of today. 
She who led the forces of the Christian world and played host to the greatest of scholars, such as Galileo. Today's Venice is but a pale reflection of its former glory. All that remains of the era when Antonia da Ponte and Michelangelo disputed the honor of building the Rialto Bridge is a double row of shops crowded with tourists. Starting with the loss of the islands of Cyprus and Crete, the decline of the Serenissima came to an end with the siege of Napoleon's troops and the abdication of the Doge in 1797. A story that ends with Venice the Supreme becoming Venice the Decadent, and in which the last areas of life, apart from hotels and restaurants, are the markets. From dawn to midday, Phoenicians come to stock up on food supplies brought in by boat and unloaded onto the quays of the Grand Canal. The banks previously lined with warehouses have retained their various names, Riva del Vin, Riva del Carbon. Nature always reclaims its rights. The scourges threatening Venice today are called pollution, erosion, sinking, and flooding. In 1966, the city experienced the highest water level rise in its history, spreading general awareness of its cause. Funds were unblocked, laws were made, and the greatest architects and engineers pulled together to restore this huge open-air museum. The code name given to this ambitious operation was Save Venice. Buildings were inspected in minute detail, town planning was meticulously reviewed, and the most incredible solutions were imagined, such as draining the canals, dismantling the palaces, and even closing the laguna. The latest project, an amazingly complex mobile seawall, has finally been adopted by the international community under the aegis of UNESCO to ensure the future of a cultural heritage now considered to belong to humanity. After centuries of immobility, the miracle of technology is suddenly spreading a wave of modernity over the city. The Palazzo Grassi, which has recently acquired the contemporary art collection of French businessman François Pinault, is symbolic of this cutting-edge boost. Beyond being simply eternal, Venice is now also contemporary. And major events like the Biennale for contemporary art and the Mostra for film are attracting a fresh wave of creative incentive. Venice has entered the third millennium wearing the colors of an international cultural scene. Never mind what the old ghosts of the city might think, such as Shakespeare's heroine Desdemona, who may well still be hiding behind the pointed windows of the Palazzo Contarini Fassan. Hundred years have passed, and it's high time Venice broke free.
from the desire to return that weighed on all who left it, she took the name Venezia, as though to utter a sweet prayer to those who leave her. Veni e siam, come back again. Luigi Grotto Cieco d'Adria, August 23rd, 1570.